In coming into this building, I always stop and look at the Atlas uh, sculpture outside, partly because it reminds me of Yanko, um, who commissioned it, but also it, it reminds me of who Atlas represents. And he, this representation of Atlas suggests to me productive people who uh, make contributions to the world. And, of course, this includes, I hope, most of you, that one day you'll contribute quite a deal. But it also includes the lady that I pass every morning who's selling tortillas to workers. She is no better or no worse or no less important than you are in terms of what you hopefully will produce one day because she is someone that's creating value for people, acting in a peaceful way, uh, and um, as I hope all of you will. So if you, if you don't notice or haven't noticed that Atlas sculpture in front of this building, I, I hope you'll contemplate that. Now, there's my email address uh, if you uh, have any further questions. I'm an economist, but I think to be a good economist, you need to know something about history, political science, accounting, law, and philosophy. Now, I don't know much about all the others. I'm not sure how much I know about economics, but I try to engage these other disciplines in order to, in some ways, justify the modern market economy. We are calling it capitalism here. I never liked the word capitalism. It uh, has Marxian uh, origin, but anyway... It's something that people generally understand. And capitalism uh, is what we will be discussing here. And the essence of capitalism really is private property markets. So now we know that if we can look at even the United Nations, which is a corrupt institution, they recognize that private property is something that we are entitled to. And if we look at sort of an understanding of what the market gives us. The market really is a civilizing institution. It civilizes us in the fact that as long as we are compelled to act in a competitive framework, we must behave in a moral and just manner. So uh, I think we can, uh, this is basically going to be my message here. So now, the, quickly, this, what I'll do is look at human uh, actions the nature of moral choices and justice, uh, and whether or not private property and markets are consistent with those concepts. And look at this idea of a market order uh, based on human liberty, how it might contribute to human dignity. Now, living a dignified life, uh, I will suggest to you, requires that you be free, that you not be the slave or the servant of other people. Because to live a dignified life, you must be able to discover and then pursue your own life purposes, as long as you, in doing so, don't interfere with other people's life purposes. Now, of course, this comes from the mission statement of this fantastic, wonderful university. It is to uh, expose students to an understanding of a society of free and responsible, that is, accountable individuals. So, now, the fundamentals of human action, in my view, really starts with scarcity. This is why I think scarcity really is a defining human condition. Uh, and the most obvious aspect of this is your mortality. Well, I'm not going to be mortal. I've decided I'm going to break precedence. But most of you are stuck with it. But mortality means that we have a limited amount of time at our disposal, and we, throughout your life, you will find that there are an unlimited number of possibilities of what you could do with your time. But you have to make choices, so there's conflict. Now, so scarcity then is, is a, an inescapable aspect of life, no matter how rich you are or no matter what. There are limited resources in terms of the goods available, whether or not it's laptops or your abilities to achieve your, your unlimited desires. We all have these. I, I would 
suggest to you admittedly unlimited desires. Now, this will always lead to conflict. That is, you have to decide whether or not you're going to receive credits for participating in this uh, lecture or hanging out at e-cafe. Well, well, let's go to e-cafe. Maybe I would rather do that. But the thing is, it's a conflict. Uh, Now, how do we resolve these conflicts? Now, this is the really essence of, the, of, in a way, the human condition. We are confronted with this scarcity, and we know this is going to generate conflicts because you want that cup of coffee, or you want to be first in the queue or whatever. So there, we've got to find ways to resolve this. And eventually, what we hope we will discover is some kind of moral guide, something that tells us the, a, a social order that is, allows human flourishing, allows progress, encourages harmony among the participants. Now, there are several ways we can accomplish this social order. We could rely on violence, theft, or slavery. Well, most of you would be opposed to that, unless you're big and strong. I'm not. The alternative generally is peace, trade, and cooperation. So we're going to explore the second range of possibility because this is really the characteristic outcomes of capitalism. So, and I'm going to suggest to you, I'm giving you this sort of punchline before I give you the entire joke, but property rights are an essential element of human liberty and Justice. So this is a very strong statement. I hope I can um, uh, substantiate that. Now, capitalism is not an ism. An ism is a belief system. Capitalism is nothing more than a system whereby people that are free and responsible are interacting with each other. It's just a definition or a description of human action and interaction. So it depends on voluntarism, self-ownership, that is the absence of slavery, and choice, that is, you're uh, allowed to exercise your choices. So free and responsible individuals interact and trade based upon voluntary, mutually agreed upon terms of trade. So this is what capitalism is about. Now, of course, what we see, the, the, what we see is this sort of uh, the breakdown of capitalism is almost always associated with some sort of external force, in particular the state, or it could be the mafia, or it could be uh, some other organization, but primarily in most of our lives, it's the state that it, uh, creates these outcomes which look less than fair, looks less than just, and they appear to be immoral. But whenever you discover these uh, outcomes, when we're examining economic processes, the fault is not with the market per se, but with some sort of external force like the state. Now, capitalism is driven not only by the brain, because actually we're trying to achieve things. We're trying to either identify and or accomplish life purposes, but it's also about the heart. Now, this is what Adam Smith contributed. Talked about empathy, and I'm not talking about altruism or, or, or giving up. It's that you put your place, your, yourself in the other person's place, and you try to understand what it is that you, it's sort of a uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, now, the role of the state under capitalism is very limited. It is to protect citizens from slavery and violence. In other words, protect their rights and their property. That's all the state should do. The state should not provide basketball courts. The state should not provide schools. The state does not need to provide highways or bridges. Only protecting individual rights and property. So so under the rule of law, which is the sort of guiding principle of modern democracy... There should be no privileges. That means no subsidies. 
There should, no, no one should receive a subsidy because if I receive a subsidy, you have to pay for it. I take away from you in order to grant me a subsidy. No one has a right for domination. And no system it has any natural right for domination. Domination is something that we seek to avoid. This is why we have revolutions. This is how modern democracy evolved, because we wanted to get away from the absolute monarchs. Now, slavery is immoral pr precisely because it involves violence and theft. So this is why we are opposed to slavery. It took mankind thousands of years. Every, every civilization, every country at some point in its history had slavery. Uh, it took mankind quite a long time and into the modern era before we began to understand why slavery is wrong. And it essentially, it's because of the violence and theft associated with it. Now, private property is in many ways, the, obviously, the antithesis of slavery. So we need to have security of private property or in absence of those protections, we will have plunder and aggression. So that if we want to escape that, we need to have a state which understands its limits, which are primarily protecting private property and, and uh, rights. Now, self-ownership, again, is the absence of slavery. You own yourself. You cannot sell yourself. I cannot buy you. But you can rent out your time, of course through a wage contract or salary contract, but the actual ownership, that is my capacity to dominate you, for you to produce on my behalf. This is something that goes against this basic principle that we have tried to sort of introduce into the idea of modern democracy, that self-ownership is essential. And private property ownership is what makes us actually human. You can't separate the ownership of yourself with the ownership of your property. Now, when someone enslaves me, they are taking away my right of self-ownership. When someone steals from me, it's as though they made me a slave for the amount of time it took for me to buy whatever it is they took from me. So this is why theft is wrong. Theft is a form of slavery. Uh, many libertarians say that taxation is a form of slavery. Now, I'm going to make a basic moral assertion. And it's a strong claim against slavery. And I think most of you would agree with that. Uh, Warren might disagree. He would like to, to have a, a slave at his disposal, but he knows it's unfair. Now, uh, so we have a natural right as humans, not based upon any sort of divine uh, ruler, supreme being, but simply by virtue of being human, we have a natural right of self-ownership and to live in peace and to be able to seek how we want to flourish as an autonomous human being. Now, again, this is... I would like to think that this is something that most of us would come to agreement with. Now, so self-ownership requires that you have first claim to whatever it is you produce. What is the reality of modern democracy? Who has the first claim to your income? The government. It's never meant to be that way. How do we get here? You have to ask that question. Why is it that we allow the state to have first claim to our income? Whatever's left over, it's okay for you to use it. <laughs> so if you live in certain countries, they take quite a lot. Now, uh, the, your rightful possession uh, implies that your property was not acquired by fraud or violence, some sort of deceit. Uh, and markets are, up till now, the best way for us to resolve these kind of 
ways for people to live freely among ourselves because it gives us the means to acquire and transfer property in a voluntary manner. That is, we can get away from theft, violence, and fraud. So, now, when we look at morality, morality must be judged as an individual act. There is no morality in state acts or state actions. It is not moral for a politician to take from you to give to her. There's no morality in that. Why? Because there's force involved. It's either implicit or explicit force. A moral action is a voluntary action. Now, someone acting on your behalf by taking funds from you, taxes, in order to give to someone else because they say it's moral is a lie. It's a deceit. It's an illusion. A moral act is an act which you do because you believe it to be right. Now, if I believe it's right to give to the poor, but I use the state to do so, there's no morality. At best, it's amoral. I would suggest it's immoral. Because who am I to decide what should be done with your resources? So, it's a sense of ethical duty. It's a personal choice. So it's not enforceable by a court of law. Governments cannot legislate morality. They cannot enforce it in a court of law because it is something that resides in your heart, in your mind, in your relationship with other human beings. So they can't be defined or changed by legislation. They can try to do it. This is what we call social engineering. And it fails. And it usually ends in misery. Now, coercion with moral intent. Now, this is what politicians say. We're doing it for the poor. Whenever I hear politicians say we're doing it for the poor, I run for the door. I reach in my pocket to make sure nothing is missing. They never care about the poor. It is a, a facade for them to do something they wish to do based upon their political calculations. It can't have a moral outcome. It's false when politicians say, we're doing it on part of the poor. Why don't you give more? The rich should pay more. No. This is a false claim. Now, morality is autonomous, derived from the inner life of individuals. Now, ask, I mean, again, ask your, if, if you're religious, ask your priest about this, you know, what makes a moral act moral. Is a, is a moral act an outcome of compulsion? No. A moral act is the outcome of your own ethical sense of duty. So moral behavior is based upon individual's choice to act. And moral disputes should not be mitigated or sort of inter interpreted by courts, per se. They should be by agents of people who share your culture. The elders of a community, priests, if you like, whatever. But not agents that act on the behalf of the state. Because they will always choose some sort of collective outcome or arrangement that has very little to do with your individual preferences. So justice is connected to individual moral actions. It's not unjust that you were born after me. It's not unjust that you were uh, born female and I was born male. It's unjust if I treat you differently because you are a female. Just acts, again, are based upon individual choices. So we need to be very cautious about how we interpret this idea of justice and how we connect it to morality. Now, to explore a little bit more in the ideas of capitalism and markets, we have opponents and supporters of these. And so this is this ongoing debate. So, for example, the opponents of the market say it's alienating, rootless, and superficial. Smells like Marx. In other words, you produce for me, and I take away the surplus value that you create and am able to... Uh, live a better life as a consequence. Uh, 
Now, on the other hand, so th this idea is actually one which is in complete ignorance of the nature of capitalism. If capitalism is human action, or humans interacting with one another, it cannot be as they suggest, because markets and prices, they arise from property rights and human cooperation. They are the humane aspects of life. They are not the alienated aspects of life. Capitalism and markets are materialistic system based on immoral and uncaring markets. Again, so an absolute ignorance of the reality of markets. Markets provide the mechanism for economic prosperity and what we would call social welfare. There are gains to the community. Adam Smith was quite disappointed. He was, you know, a moral philosopher and, and quite concerned with what makes people act and how people should act. And he was kind of disappointed. He said, yeah, people don't act based on their best motive. They act on their strongest motive, which was self-interest. Disappointing. Ah! And then he came to the conclusion, well, but self-interest can generate social welfare in a market context. Now, Karl Marx saw private ownership as the problem. Adam Smith understood that private property is the solution if we want to have peaceful resolution of conflicts. Now, so voluntary exchange is the clearest example of just outcomes because it will only occur if all parties believe it to be fair. So, this is where we have the moral content of markets in that everyone is allowed, as long as the state is not creating privileges, granting subsidies, engaging in protectionism, in a market dominated by competition of free and responsible individuals, we will get these outcomes. We don't get these outcomes if the state regulates, intervenes, and directs our interactions. So, uh, what do we have here? Voluntary trades tend to be just or fair outcomes, or people would not engage in them. It's, a, uh, it's, it's, it's just a logical uh, argument. Now, efficiency is quite important to economists because we want to conserve scarce resources. This Economists are the original environmentalists. We're concerned with conserving resources. Uh, we find that the uh, private property helps provide a system of order, an orderly sort of uh, social interaction based upon discovering values that entrepreneurs are revealing to us, things that we didn't even know exi could exist, uh, things that we would value that we never imagined. Equity. We can have equity if governments do not grant privileges. Markets and private property encourage people to trust one another. COVID policies, the pandemic policies, were the most destructive act of governments outside of wars because they destroyed trust. We were taught to view each other as carriers of death, dangerous pathogens. Uh, peace and cooperation is the general outcome. It's the potential outcome, and it will occur if states do not intervene. Uh, so private property and markets encourage and reward moral behavior and just interactions, and they're necessary for the human liberty of all citizens. So I've got 11 seconds, so I made it. <laughs> Thank you very much.